Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NV's webinar on, under Ek Bharat Shreshth Bharat Initiative. Ek Bharat Shreshth Bharat Initiative is an initiative from the Prime Minister Narendra, Narendra Modi to enhance the interaction and mutual understanding of the culture and also the diversity among the states as well as universe, un, uh, union territories. So in this initiative, the, uh, you know, uh, the states as well as uh, union territories are paired and uh, they are sharing their uh, culture according, as well as environment, uh, traditions, music, tourism and sport related uh, best practices. So under this initiative, Envy Center at Indian Institute of Science, we are conducting a series of webinars. So in this regard, we have today with us Dr. Sudarshan Bhatt, who is uh, sharing his knowledge on macrophytes in aquatic ecosystem. Dr. Sudarshan Bhatt is an assistant professor at SDM College, Ujre. Earlier, he was working, uh, worked at Indian Institute of Science as a uh, research assistant. So his research interest includes bioremediation, heavy metal analysis uh, through macrophytes, biochemistry, bioanalytical techniques, microbiology, as well as biostatistics. He has published 15 research paper in peer reviewed journals. He has received a best paper award during Lake Symposium uh, at Alvas College, Murbidri. He has co guided five master students for their dissertation. So I request Dr. Sudarshan to share his views on macrophytes in aquatic ecosystem. Over to you, Sudarshan. Thank you, Setur. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, TVR sir for giving me opportunity to talk on macrophytes in aquatic ecosystem which was uh, my uh, research area during my uh, uh, research uh, when I was doing PhD. So uh, currently I am working as a uh, assistant professor in uh, SDM College Ujire. So uh, when you uh, see about macrophytes, the word macrophytes, so what it uh, gives you an idea. So these uh, are the plant species normally found growing in the wetlands. So when you see these plants uh, or these macrophyte, it is called as they will be growing in the wetlands. So they will be in or on the water. So uh, like uh, uh, maybe some of them will be inside the water or some will be emerging out of the water or where soils are flooded or saturated long enough for anaerobic condition to develop in the root zone. That means uh, sometimes they need the saturated soil ones. Uh, after the rainy season, uh, there will be sometimes uh, some saturated uh, soil near uh, in the shoreline of the lakes. So that conditions also they will be growing. So totally these kind of plants will be called as macrophytes. So when you split the word macrophytes, so macro, it means seen with the naked eye. So in the naked eye, you can see them. And the phyte gives the word uh, plant, Greek word. It is a uh, Greek word. It, it is called as plant. So uh, when you split the word, it is uh, macro fight. So uh, we, uh, the plant which can be seen during, uh, through the naked eye. Uh, uh, in simply, you can say like that. So most often used to describe the plants living in wetlands or in truly aquatic environments like lakes. So you, you can see these plants in uh, wetlands. So where uh, uh, and also in the uh, truly aquatic environments. So in the lakes and other ponds or. Um, uh, where the water is throughout the year. So then an aquatic plant large enough to be seen by the naked eye. As we saw in the word, it, it should be large enough to be seen by the naked eye. Then the distribution of these uh, macrophytes in lakes is subject to two basic constraints. That is uh, two uh, principles govern the uh, growth mainly, the growth of these macrophytes, uh, aquatic plants you can say. So that is water must be shallow enough for light to reach the bottom. So, uh, because these are photosynthetic uh, uh, plants, uh, the uh, uh, shallow water should be there and the light should reach them. If they are submerged, means the light should be reaching them, especially for the submerged ones. Then physical stability sufficient to allow plants to grow to the bottom. Uh, yeah, again, the stability of the plant also should uh, be sufficient to allow the plants to grow to the bottom. That is, they should uh, take their nutrients from soil sediment also. Those are some basic things about macrophytes. Then when you uh, see the functions of the macrophytes in aquatic system, what is their role? So first one is they are the base of the food chain. So we know the food chain base. So all the green plants like uh, them, uh, green plants, terrestrial plants, these macrophytes also base of the food chain in aquatic ecosystem mainly. So herbivores and detritivorous food chains providing food to invertebrates, fish, 
then birds then and also organic carbon for bacteria so even for the microorganisms they will be giving the dead materials for uh, decomposing material you can say so like that uh, they will be acting as a food to all others also invertebrates fishes and other aquatic birds also then through photosynthesis they link the inorganic environment with the biotic one the inor inorganic environment like carbon and other nutrients they will be linking with the biotic one that is they will be providing the nutrient to the other biotic uh, components then provide habitat for other groups such as epiphytic bacteria periphyton macro invertebrates fish amphibians insects so again they will be playing important role in providing the habitat for the bacteria microorganisms then periphyton attached uh, the some uh, microorganism will be always growing attaching uh, to these um, macrophytes or aquatic plants then macro invertebrates uh, then uh, aquatic insects you can say then fishes then amphibians then insects all these uh, organisms they will be living in uh, this uh, macrophytes so they will be acting as a habitat for them then they influence the water chemistry so acting as both nutrient six sinks through uptake and new uptake and as nutrient pumps moving compound from sediment to water column so again they will be acting as a or they will be influencing the water chemistry the uh, uh, components of the water like uh, uh, nutrients or other uh, any comp components water chemistry so they will be acting as both nutrient sinks uh, they will be taking the nutrients from the water especially uh, and as nutrient pumps they will be taking so that they will be called as nutrient pumps moving compound from sediment to water column so especially from the uh, uh, sediments they will be taking the nutrients also they will be taking from water also then influence the hydrology and sediment regime of wetlands again they will be governing the uh, sediment sediment conditions also by taking uh, in the earlier point as said the uh, whatever the nutrients they will be taking and they will be controlling the influ or influencing the biogeochemical processes in water and sediment that may be the uh, nutrient cycles maybe n and p especially so act as biological indicators of health or ecological integrity of the wetland again they are uh, like other uh, organisms like amphibians and other uh, aquatic insects they will be also acting as a biological indicators by seeing the number and uh, condition of these uh, macrophytes especially the diversity uh, by looking them you can say the health of this aquatic ecosystem that is why they are called as again biological indicators of the aquatic ecosystem or the wetland you can say then the last point is food biomass and medicine value culture and economy so this is gaining importance as a uh, food so many uh, macrophytes are food for either uh, whatever we discuss for other organisms uh, which are uh, habitat uh, so they will be food for them also or uh, some uh, for humans also so many of them are food then biomass and uh, uh, biomass for uh, biogas and other uh, uses then medicinal value so many of them like uh, nymphia then lotus etc they will be having highest uh, medicinal values and culture and economic importance also so uh, in the medicinal field so many of them are uh, extracted and uh, so many phytochemical studies are going on still it is uh, under uh, a very good research area so uh, these are some of the uses you can say then next you, when you see the growth when there is enough room for colonization and abundant availability of nutrients macrophytes show a high growth rate so when as we saw in the role they will be taking nutrients from the sediment so whenever there are there are abundant nutrients in the sediments or water they will be growing highly or they will the growth will be high so or the growth rate will be high macrophytes show a high growth rate they assimilate nutrients directly into their tissues they will take nutrients and they will be absorbing it in the or storing it in their nutrients especially in the sorry in the tissues uh, leaf or uh, which are stem it is shoot or roots sometimes they will be accumulating in the roots especially then useful for treating waste water so this is also one of the important area uh, of research so they will be treating the waste water can say by treating the by absorbing the uh, n and p or other uh, heavy metals etc then uh, include seven plant plant divisions so under if you consider the plant divisions so these are the divisions which will come under these uh, groups which will come under these macrophytes that is cyanobacteria so some of the cyanobacteria will come under this uh, macrophytes then chlorophyta then rhodophyta xanthophyta bryophyta pteridophyta and spermatophyta so some of the pteridophytes will also come come and bryophyta like pistia and others will also will be uh, coming under this uh, plant division sorry in the macrophyte uh, group 
so when you see the classification of uh, pants especially this seven pant division will come under it. then three major groups are the uh, carels so some uh, that is order of chlorophyta comprising large up to 2 meter and relatively complex multicellular algae so especially algae so that is cyanobacteria and chlorophyta so when you consider then uh, carels are the group will come under that and together with the vascular pants that is pteridophyta and spermatophyta so others will be like uh, xanthophyta pteridophyta etc uh, pteridophyta and spermatophyta are the uh, other two groups mainly that is about the divisions which divisions will uh, come under this macrophyte group then when you come to the types of macrophytes there will be four basic morphological types basically occupying the zones of increasing depth so when you see the as you see in the uh, picture when you see the uh, depth wise or the zone wise there are four uh, basically four types of macrophytes you can classify them as four types that is emergent macrophytes you can see here in the uh, uh, tip or the uh, end which are emerging at the shore lines then free floating macrophytes which will be freely floating in the water surface also called as clistrophytes and uh, the emergent one are, uh, they are also called as tenag tenagophytes then floating leaved ones so some will be having uh, leaves which will be floating in the water surface and uh, roots in the sediment so th third type will come under that then uh, totally submerged ones that is fourth type that is submerged macrophytes so these are the four types when you go uh, characters of these uh, four types first one is emergent macrophytes so these will be especially they will be growing in the transition zone between the land and water especially in the transition zone or the shore lines you can say so they will be having root in the sediment and or the saturated soils that is especially in the uh, anaerobic condition the sediments they will be having uh, anaerobic condition and roots will be growing there and the shoots will be extending out to the air and they will be carrying out for photosynthesis that is what they must be self supporting and gets carbon dioxide from the air for photosynthesis so mostly angiosperms will be coming under these groups that is emergent um, uh, mainly two groups that is uh, uh, erect emergent and creeping emergent so sometimes uh, typha like, uh, for example like typha uh, where you can see in the picture they will be erect emergent they will be erect and sometimes uh, groups like alternanthera and ludwigia they will be creeping in the surface of the uh, land that is why they are emergent but they will be creeping emergents so these are emergent macrophytes next when you see floating macrophytes uh, as the word says they will be totally floating in the water surface so leaves and stem float on the water surface so if roots present hang free in water and not anchored in the sediments so roots they will be hang free freely hanging in the water uh, unlike uh, the other one they won't be in the sediments move on the water surface with, with wind and water current so as the wind move, comes uh, or the according to the wind current they will be moving if you see the water as in pishti and all for example uh, they will be moving according to the water current uh, or the wind uh, uh, when the wind blows they will be uh, moved from one place to the another place in the uh, water surface of the lakes or ponds for example uh, these are the two types another one is lemna that is uh, one small uh, group of plants tiniest uh, plants in the world then icornia crassipes famous example is water hyacinth so these are these will be coming under floating macrophytes so next group that is floating leaved ones so as the word says they will be having leaves in floating and the uh, roots in the sediments so root in the sediment leaves float on the surface then connections are via stems or long petioles you can say so they will be having long connections to the leaves from the roots with the uh, petioles or stems long stems so need to have some standing water but limited by petiole or stem length so especially they will be growing in the standing water but uh, depends on the stem or the petiole length then in case of water lilies both root and stem are underwater and petioles extends uh, through water uh, to surface leaves so in, if you see the water lily so both root and stem are, they will be in the under water surface and petioles will be uh, extending through the uh, uh, surface so examples are like water lily uh, nymphia then uh, lotus etc so these are example for floating leaved macrophytes then comes the submerged macrophytes so these are totally underwater plants so they will be having no supporting tissues like uh, when you see the emergent or uh, floating ones uh, they will be uh, they won't be having supporting tissues they will be relying on turgor pressure and buoyancy to maintain erect form the turgor pressure of the uh, water and uh, the buoyancy the floating capacity so they will be uh, uh, governing the uh, 
support of the support uh, growth, growth support then uh, underwater leaves often finely dissected and maybe uh, lamina so they will be having finely dissected leaves like when you see the picture you can see the dissected leaves they will be having and heterophily that is they will be having two types of leaves so uh, that some species like myriophyllum and uh, other potamogatan they will be having two types of leaves then valley scenario so these are some of the examples so some of the examples we will be seeing in the later part so just i am highlighting what are the types then when you see the adaptations of these macrophytes so they will be having these are the, some of the adaptations like erenchyma so they will be having erenchyma means air, air tissues so they have to float or so especially the floating ones and the uh, floating leaved ones so they will be having erenchyma then dissected or segmented waxy leaves so as we saw in the submerged ones, they will be having segmented and dissected leaves and waxy leaves. So to uh, protect the water, they will be uh, uh, in water always. So to protect from decomposition and all, they will be having waxy leaves. Then cuticle absent or thin layer. So because uh, cuticle is for the respiration and all. Uh, so but here, uh, gases exchange and uh, the other things. So sorry to prevent the uh, water loss especially. So, but here they will be always uh, uh, in the water. That's why it is absent. Then less rigid. The strength will be less uh, as we saw in the uh, uh, submerged ones and all. Then light and feathery roots. Uh, roots will be feathery like in water hyacinth when you see. Then less xylem also. That is water condu conducting tissues. Like in the terrestrial plants, the xylem tissue is very less. So, the because they are always in the water, the tissue is less developed. So next, uh, the factors affecting growth, composition, and diversity of these macrophytes. So these are the four factors mainly. One is water depth. So according to the water depth, you can see the diversity of macrophytes. So it depends on the water depth. So if it is shallow, means some of the macrophytes will be growing. And if it is deep, means some of the submerged and other uh, uh, will be growing like that. And water chemistry, especially second factor is water chemistry, the uh, nutrient factors. So if it is pure water, means uh, submerged ones, you can see. And uh, polluted ones, you can see only the uh, floating like, um, uh, sorry, what has in and etc. Then flow rate also. Sometimes the uh, only floating will be there in the, uh, whenever the wind flow is there and all. Then sediment regime also. So uh, the rooted ones, especially the first one, the uh, emergent and the floating leaved ones, they will be governed by the sediment quality. So these are the four factors which will be affecting the growth, composition and diversity of these uh, macrophytes. So then when you consider the research, uh, about research of these macrophytes, how we will be sampling these uh, macrophytes especially. So when we do the sampling, it depends on the type of habit, then type of vegetation, variation and distribution of the vegetation and aim of our study. What is our aim? So only to find out the diversity or whether we have to study the nutrient composition or other water chemistry or it depends on our study, aim of the study. Then also it depends on the habit. So whether it is a uh, aquatic uh, purely polluted ones or uh, pure uh, pure ones like that, then type of vegetation. So maybe it will be near to uh, some uh, forest area like that. Then variation and distribution of the vegetation. So again, it depends on the vegetation mainly. Then uh, it is essential to first survey the area and decide about the suitable sampling methods. So before sampling as uh, in other methods, when we do the terrestrial sampling also, here also we have to survey the area and decide about the suitable sampling methods. So usually the quadrat method of 1 meter one uh, by 1 meter or 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter quadrat uh, method of sampling will be followed for the uh, sampling of these macrophytes. So this is the image showing how we will be sampling, especially 1 meter by 1 meter or 50 centimeter by 50 centimeter quadrat we will be laying and we will be uh, counting the numbers or whatever our uh, aim of the study we will be doing. Either we'll be counting the diversity or number of species or uh, uh, we'll be sampling the um, macrophytes for our nutrient analysis or other any heavy metal and so whatever it is. Then coming to identification, uh, so they will be collected and identified using morphological keys. So especially the uh, keys are available for the uh, macrophytes, published flora are there. So by using them, we'll be identifying the macrophytes. Then vegetation mapping is done to calculate the total macrophytic biomass of different species in a water body. So when you do the mapping, like terrestrial vegetation mapping here also, to find out the biomass in a meter square area, per meter square, what is the biomass of these uh, various macrophytes, we will do the sampling. Then uh, to understand the, the distribution pattern of vegetation. 
so especially the diversity so how it is uh, distributed along a lake or aquatic uh, ecosystem then to monitor the changes caused by a pollutant on these patterns at various times so again the one of the factor is the pollution so how the pollution is affecting the diversity so uh, these are three are the um, uh, objectives when you do the vegetation or macfit mapping then uh, how we will be treating after sampling so immediately we will be washing the adhered uh, things like soil and other any other adhered adhering matters if it is some other microorganism and all we will be thoroughly washing them then drain out the excess water after washing so we will be draining out the excess water by using filter paper or blotting paper then take the fresh weight of the sample after that we will be taking the fresh weight so that is the fresh weight of that sample then we will be transporting them the uh, them to the lab in polythene especially ziploc cover bags after that we will be doing different estimations so first one is biomass estimation how we will be doing so after determining the fresh weight of the samples uh, we will be drying it uh, we will be usually drying it in hot, hot air oven for at 105 degree for celsius for 24 hours that is uh, one day for the determination of dry weight then we will be taking the dry weight so biomass we will be expressing it as uh, dry matter per unit area so after the we after we will be getting the dry weight we will express it as per unit area so we have sampled in a meter square area so whatever dry weight we are getting dry weight per uh, that uh, meter square area so that is about biomass next uh, other uh, things like nutrient and other metal analysis we will be using the dried samples for the analysis so the dried samples are powdered into fine powders so we will be powder, powdering them using mortar and pestle usually and these samples are used for estimation of nutrients and heavy metals so especially n p and carbon nitrogen phosphorus then uh, like metals like various metals like zinc uh, whichever are of our interest then for other phytochemical extractions then other uh, other analysis uh, like medicinal uses we will be taking these dry samples especially so then uh, we will see some of the commonly found macrophytes in uh, our wetlands especially in in the indian wetlands we can see some of the these common uh, macrophytes so first one free, some of the free floating examples so first one is icornia crassipes the scientific name is icornia crassipes uh, which belongs to the family pontederaceae if you consider the botanical family it is pontederaceae so commonly called as uh, water hyacinth the image shows that so it is a famous uh, plant which we can see in the bangalore wetlands so free floating perennial aquatic plant so it will be free floating and uh, perennial it is so throughout the year it will be growing then uh, we, with broad thick glossy ovate leaves so you can you see the leaves so broad thick uh, glossy that is shining and ovate leaves ovate if you see the uh, shape it is ovate with spongy petiole if you see the petioles this is the petiole so you can see if you cut them it will be like a sponge then uh, roots if you see it is feathery and fibrous so if you see the image you can see it is a feathery and fibrous roots so then flowering time is usually march to july so this period you can see the flowering pink uh, flowers then uh, not pink uh, sorry purple flowers so habitat it is it will be growing in still or slow flowing fresh water in tropical and uh, temperate climates so these are the climates in the tropical and temperate climates you can see in still water or sometimes in the slow moving fresh water conditions you can see these then the optimum conditions are between 28 degrees celsius to 30 degrees celsius so they will be growing very uh, profusely during uh, this temperature that is 28 to 30 degrees celsius temperature they need and requires abundant nutrient conditions that is n p and uh, especially potassium n p k so like other plants uh, when uh, nutrients especially n p and k is available in the water especially because it is a free floating one they will be growing abundantly then some of the impacts uh, this is one of the notorious plant so what are the impacts so if they grow they will be harmful to fishing so they will be growing profusely and covering the entire water body and they will be depleting the dissolved oxygen of the water so if you see the water content the dissolved oxygen will be uh, very low so they will be uh, affecting the water quality then depleting water content from the water bodies and interfering in water utilization and other activities so many times uh, in a fresh water body if they will grow they will be not suitable for uh, utilization for other purposes so they will be interfering in the activities then dense vegetation and innumerable rootlets obstruct water flow in irrigation channels and displaces many aquatic grasses which are useful as fodder for cattle so this is in some other uh, channels and all if they start growing they will be replacing other uh, species other grass species or uh, cypress species and all which are useful so they will uh, uh, 
remove the other species especially they will profusely grow and uh, uh, cover the entire area so suppresses the phytoplankton growth also again they will be suppressing other uh, not only phytoplankton other species like zooplankton and all so only the uh, phytoplankton sorry the water hyacinth will be going and they will be uh, reducing the growth of algae especially so this is the image of bangalore lakes especially I have, all images are taken during my uh, research uh, period when i was in iac so in bangalore lakes especially so this is uh, jakur and another another one lake uh, especially when it is covered with the, entirely with the water hyacinth so this is one more come on the lake when it was covered with the uh, entirely with the water hyacinth so this is how they will be blocking the water water bodies then some of the uses are of this uh, uh, water hyacinth are used as a fodder manure then source of methane and alcohol so and also phytoremediation so these are the, some of the very useful uh, uh, use, uses of this water hyacinth it is not a spent but also some of the uses are like fodder as you saw in the image the cow is happily eating that so it is used as fodder because of high nutrient con uh, content then uh, but you should be careful when it grows in the polluted conditions it may contain high amount of metal content and other some other contaminants then uh, as used as a manure also so in bio uh, through biogas and all then um, source of methane and alcohol so research is going on uh, this area also uh, production of methane uh, from this uh, and also ethanol alcohol so because they will be containing high amount of biomass and other content uh, they will be uh, the biomass will be high so uh, compared to other uh, macrophytes, it, it is good for uh, methane and alcohol. Then phytoremediation. Phytoremediation, uh, it, it, it is to remove the contaminants, especially metal pollution and other uh, some of the uh, uh, other pollutions. So to remove the pollutants, they will be used. That is why it is called as phytoremediators or phyto is just uh, for the phytoremediation purpose. Phyto means using plants, so aquatic plants, that is uh, especially water acid. Then also compost. So you can prepare good amount of compost from this uh, uh, water hyacinth. Then if you see the nutrient content, very high percentage for, it will be expressed as percentage dry weight. So phosphorus is 0.1 to 1.2 percentage and nitrogen is 1 to 4 percent. So this is the percentage of uh, nutrients, especially N and P in this uh, water hyacinth plants. Then if you see the nutrient removal capacity per kg per hectare per day, they will be removing about 12.78 kg of uh, N and 2.43 of phosphorus. So this is this shows the highest amount of neutral capacity of this water hyacinth. So that is about water hyacinth. Then next species is Pistia strachyotes strash that is uh, belonging to the family Araceae. So commonly called as Pistia. So again, it is a uh, free floating one. So common name is water cabbage or water lettuce. It is called as. So used as a ornamental plant also sometimes. So it is again aquatic free floating then odorous herb if you see the smell it is having a little bit uh, smell some odor, odor so soft leaves that form a rosette the leaves are in the uh, rose manner so that is why it is called as rosette if you see the image you can see it's like a rose the leaves arrangement of leaves then roots hanging submerged beneath floating leaves so if you see the roots below the leaves so it will be hanging then the leaves can be up to 14 centimeter long and have no stem uh, again, they will be just, uh, they will, if you see the uh, image, you can understand only just after the roots, they will be having only leaves. So no stem, light green with parallel veins. If you see the veins, parallel veins. So if you see the images, you can see the veins, parallel veins, then wavy margins and are covered in short hairs. So you can see here in the middle, you can see some small short hairs, which form basket like structures, which trap air bubbles. So, which will be increasing the plant's buoyancy. So, they will be increasing the floating capacity of these macrophytes, especially. Then, when you see the habitat, this will be in uh, waters with high nutrient content. Again, like uh, water resin, they will be will be growing in the high nutrient content, particularly those ha that have been contaminated with human loading of sewage or fertilizers. So, with the human sewage, domestic sewage and uh, uh, fertilizers uh, flow, if it is there. Uh, runoff is there, they will be having high nutrient content and they will be these plants will be growing aquatic plants or macrophytes. Then impact again, like if you consider it will be major weed like uh, water hyacinth. This is also major weed of lakes, dams and other uh, irrigation channels, water sources and slow moving waterways in tropical, subtropical and warm, warm temperature conditions. So again, they are harmful. So again, they will be completely covering the water body and uh, depleting the 
or lowering the dissolved oxygen content of uh, water. So this is one of the image again in Kamagonda Nali in Bangalore. It is covered entirely with one species that is uh, Pistia. So sometimes you see in the Alsur Lake also Pistia dominating the lake. So these are some of the images. So again, if you see the uses used in medicine, medicine as antiseptic, then anti-decentric, insecticide, and also in the cure of asthma. So used for feeding ducks and pigs, that is uh, as a fodder. So in the medicine, if you see, they will be having high amount of antiseptic, anti-decentric, insecticide, also used as insecticide and in the uh, cure of asthma. So phytochemical extraction, if you see, these are the, some of the uses. So some of the phytochemical compounds, phyto, uh, so many of the compounds are present in these aquatic plants, some of the plants especially, like, uh, and uh, we'll come to that. So in the Pistia, if you consider, these are the some of the medical uses. Then poultry field. So again, it is uh, used as a feed. Then ornamental. So as I said in the initially, uh, this will be used as ornamental plant sometimes. Then in phytoremediation. So again, in to, to remove the metal and the nutrient content from the water, it can be used as a phytoremediators. Then if you see the nutrient content, percentage dry, dry weight wise, it is 1.2 to 4 percentage of nitrogen it will be removing and phosphorus 0.2 to 1.2 percentage. Uh, per hectare, sorry, the uh, content, the content uh, in the dry weight, it will be this much, 1.2 to 4 percentage and uh, phosphorus of 0.2 to 1.2 percentage. Then the removal capacity will be 9.85 kilogram per hectare per day and phosphorus 2.18 kilogram per hectare per day. <coughs> so next species that is again free floating that is lemna so uh, tiny plant uh, in the world that is lemna so uh, lemnaceae it is also called as or duckweed commonly called as because it is uh, food for ducks feeding ducks so that is why uh, duckweed common duckweed it is called as uh, if you see there are two types that is lemna minor so uh, smaller little smaller one so it will be free floating aquatic plants with one two or three leaves if you see here it will be having one two three leaves here you can see three leaves with each uh, each with a single root hanging in the water so it will be having uh, each leaf will be having single roots as more leaves grow the plants divide and become separate individuals so when they divide they will be becoming like this uh, more individuals so again if you consider the habitat perennial then grows in water with high uh, nutrient levels and a ph of between 5 and 9 if you see the ph condition it is 5 and 9 and temperatures 6 and 13, wide range of temperature they will be growing from 6 to 33 degrees Celsius, not like <coughs> what I see. And the flowering period especially May to July. So this is the, sorry, uh, yes, uh, it is during May to July. Uh, so this is the image of lemna minor and major. So the bigger ones are uh, major especially and the smaller ones are uh, minor. So it is somewhat little bigger than the minor ones. So two species can be seen in that. Then significance when you consider importance food resource as the word says duckweed for fish, ducks and poultry and cattle because of high nutrient content. Then removal of nutrients from wastewater or phytoremediators. Then again uh, as water as in compost and fertilizers. They can be used. Then nutrient content when you see the percentage wise dry weight it will be having 2.5 to 5.9 percentage of nitrogen and phosphorus 0.4 to 1.8 percentage. Then the capacity will be uh, 2.92 kg per hectare per day of nitrogen and phosphorus 0.87 kg per hectare per day. So this is the removed capacity of these uh, plants. Next uh, next species free floating that is um, uh, Wolfia. Again the smallest flowering plant in the world that is the angiosperm belonging to angiosperms. So it is also called as uh, common water meal. If you see it will be uh, like a uh, small round ones, globus, globus structure. So common water meal and again it is a perennial or annual so found in tanks pools and in eutrophic water then they will be combining with the other duckweed uh, lemna minor or major it will be along them they will be growing these duckweed species uh, sorry the wolfia species so floating fronts single or two remaining attached so again if you see it will be uh, having two fronts that is the two leaves you can say it is single leaf it will be having again they will be attached to they will be attached and globose to avoid the structure will be uh, oval or globose somewhat globe structure then roots they will be uh, there will be absent no roots then free floating and bright green the color will be bright green then primary method of reproducing budding so they will be uh, reproducing through budding so no sexual or uh, other uh, reproduction method 
especially through budding. So, which can result in great numbers if neutrons are available. So, because of this budding, they will be highly, the uh, reproduction rate will be high and they will be growing very highly. So, this is the image of that globose structure. Uh, you can see here, whole structures. So, if you see the structure, so this is the one. This is the image of this uh, plant. So, again, the uses like wastewater treatment, then uh, as a fodder for uh, fishes, uh, carp, nile, nile tilapia, then chickens then used as source by humans also sometimes. So this will be having again high amount of nutrients. So if that's a food source by humans also. Next one more uh, free floating one is azolacea, like uh, the other one, it is also free floating one. So it is also called azola, azolacea family is the azolacea. Then feathered mosquito form, it is commonly called as mosquito fern. Uh, it belongs to the pteridophyte, that is why right, it is a fern. A fern. Uh, uh, because it looks like a feather, uh, the structure looks like a feather, that is why feather mosquito form. Then um, habitat, mosquito, especially the mosquito breeding um, place, this if you it grows in the lakes. Annual sometimes uh, or perennial. So sometimes it will be annual or it will be going, growing throughout, that is perennial in permanent water. Then <clears throat> free floating on permanent or temporary water. So again, it is free floating in rice fields, you can see, and canals and ponds some other times. Then used as fertilizer, again it is a source of fertilizer, then contains nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. So one uh, interesting thing in this plant is it contains nitrogen fixing cyanobacteria. So these are nitrogen fixers. So these azola. So especially in the rice field and all you can see this azola and also sometimes people will grow artificially in the uh, to feed uh, cows and all. So they will be uh, capturing the atmospheric nitrogen and they will be fixing this nitrogen. So the roots, uh, they will be simple, bearing numerous root hairs. So they will be having uh, numerous root hairs. The stems alternately branched. If you see the branching pattern, they will be having alternate uh, branch types. Then branches arrange pinnately or bipinnately. Bi so that is the leaves uh, mm, arrangement. Uh, alternate leaves, you can see, and the pinnate and bipinnate leaves. If you see the taxonomy part, the uh, uh, leaves will be pinnately or bipinnately. So I won't uh, go deeply in that. Then thick green and usually somewhat reddish. So if you can see the color somewhat uh, reddish. And especially flowering time is during November to February. Then again, if you see the nutrient content, percentage dry weight is, uh, per weight is uh, phosphorus 0 0.1 to 3.39, somewhat less 2.5 to 4.5 of, uh, of nitrogen it will be contained. Then the removal capacity will be uh, nitrogen 1.08 kg per hectare per day and phosphorus 0 0.33 kg per hectare per day. So this is about Azola. So this is the one. So you can see slightly reddish ones. And sometimes it will be some green. So uh, it depends So on the uh, species. So you can see here reddish ones. And uh, so one thing is uh, the nitrogen fixers. They act as nitrogen fixers. Then value, uh, if you see the significance, other significance, valuable as biological indicator for of nutrient levels in wetlands. So again, they will be acting as a bioindicators. Then valuable in constructed wetlands for reducing nutrient loads and limiting algal growth. So they will be limiting the algal growth and they will be reducing the nutrient loads because they will be taking high amount of nutrients like other aquatic plants. Then through its association with blue-green algae, uh, Azola fixes atmospheric nitrogen and rapidly takes up nutrients in the water. So this is the one feature of this uh, Azola especially, along with the blue-green algae. So they will be taking this uh, atmospheric nitrogen and they will be fixing it. So that is one capacity of this uh, azola used as biofertilizer in rice cultivation. So in rice cult cultivation, biofertilizer, uh, so like because they will be having high uh, nitrogen content as a source of fertilizer, they will be used this uh, azola plant itself. That is biofertilizer. Then provides uh, a high pro food protein food source for uh, and habitat for water birds, then fish, insects, snails, crustaceans, cattle. That is especially, yeah, cattle, they will be used as a food source because of high protein and nutrient contents. So again, it's a fodder. That is about Azola. Then next one is Salvinia. That is again free floating. So common name is water velvet, water fern or water moss. Then again, this is uh, sometimes perennial or annual. So both conditions, they will be growing. Then free floating mat building plants. So they will be forming a thick mats. Then morphology, the stems will be floating again. So this will be having small stems. They will be floating irregularly fork. So they will be having fork, irregular fork kind of things. Then without roots. So if you see the morphology, the they will be without roots. I'll show the images. Then leaves in worlds of three, two, uh, three or two of them. 
uh, sorry, three, uh, two will be floating and one will be submerged. So if you see the three leaves, one will be submerged and three will be floating. Sorry, two will be floating. Total three leaves. Floating leaves, photosynthesis. The pho uh, they will be photosynthetic and entire with complex unwettable hairs on upper surface. Again, they will be having small hairs like pistia. They will be, if you see carefully, they will be having unwettable hairs. So they will be having thick waxy coating. Unwettable hair you can see on the uh, uh, upper surface. Sorry, uh, uh, upper surface and wettable hairs on the uh, lower surface. Then uh, submerged leaves, not photosynthetic. So submerged ones, they won't be carrying out photosynthetic. Photosynthesis finally divided into filamentous segments, which bear a striking resemblance to roots. So these uh, uh, underwater leaves, they will be finally divided into filamentous segments. So they will be uh, uh, seen as a roots. Then impacts again, they will be serious pests. They will be also covering the entire lake if you they grow, if they grow. Then spreading by vegetative fragments. So that is, they will be divided by vegetative fragment fragmentation, especially. Then can rapidly spread to complete uh, completely cover the surface of water bodies, generating up to 400 ton of wet weight per hectare. This is just one statistics I have put. That is 400 ton of wet weight they will be having per hectare, effectively blocking light and killing aquatic plants and fish. Other like water hyacinth and other macrophytes, they will be killing other plants and uh, organisms, water aquatic plants, uh, aquatic organisms. So this is the structure. If you see uh, two leaves and uh, one uh, submerged leaves, so like that. So this is the one segmented one. And uh, this is the one. So green. Uh, they will be. This is the uh, sketch, and this is the real image of that uh, Salvinia. Then reproduction. If you see, they will be again uh, by vegetative. As I said, uh, fragmentation by dividing into daughter plants, doubling in as uh, little as three to four days. Within three four to four days, they will be dividing. So uh, doubling. They will be dou doubling. And nutrient content, if you see percentage dry weight wise, they will be having 2 to 4.8 percentage of nitrogen and 0 0.2 to 0.9 percentage of less amount of phosphorus. Then again, as a livestock fodder and roots, especially they use as a fish feed. So this is the uh, image of this uh, uh, Salvinia growing. Roots means the uh, uh, submerged leaves, third type of third leaves. So these are about floating ones. Then next comes the emergent ones. So as in the initially I saw, I said uh, they will be growing in the shorelines. So in the transition zones. So first one is creeping. We see, we will see. So there will be directly emergent and creeping ones. So some of the creeping examples uh, and uh, emergent will uh, uh, erect emergent will be seen. So uh, first one is alternanthera phylloxeroids, uh, amaranthaceae. The family is amaranthaceae. So this is the creeping ones. So common name is alligator weed. So it is called as alligator weed. So it is. It will be growing in a variety of habitats. So including dry land, but usually found in the water. Sometimes when the lake bed dries, then also they, we can see this uh, growing these macrophytes, especially used as highly used as vegetables. So as green leaf vegetables, these will be eaten by humans. Then stems are pinkish. So if you the, see the stems, they will be pinkish in color, long and branch. So if you see the stems, then hollow. If you cut the stems, it will be hollow. Then fleshy, succulent stems can grow horizontally and float on the surface of water. So especially they will be helping in the floating. When water is there, they will be helping in the floating. Then forming rafts or form mat, matted clumps. So they will form like a mat clump, clumping in the water surface. This is the image, flower and uh, the plant. And the stem, if you see, it is pinkish. So leaves are simple, uh, elliptic and smooth margins. If you see the leaves, it will be having smooth margins then uh, uh, simple leaves not compound leaves then they are opposite in pairs or worlds so if you see the pattern they will be opposite to each other and in worlds worlds means it will be having a group with the distinct midrib you can see the midrib clearly then flowers whitish if you see in the image you can see clearly papery ball so it is the papery ball shaped flowers that grow on stalks so this is the stalk of flower so especially you can see the stalk flower with the stalk not like other plants so like terrestrial entities. So then roots, fibrous roots arise, arising at the stem nodes and may hang free in the water or penetrate into the sediment or soil. So if you see the roots, it will be in the nodes of the stems. If you see the stem nodes, that is uh, connections of these uh, stems, uh, nodes, especially it is called as, so joints. So they will be containing the roots. So they will be hanging there, grow on, uh, they will be growing in the nodes, especially. And they will be penetrating into sediments. Then flowering period is during December to April. Usually they will be flowering during December to April and reproduction vegetative. Again, it is by vegetative, not by sexual reproduction. 
so in fact again it is a uh, weed the word uh, common uh, word is alligator weed so it will be weed so it disrupt uh, disrupt the aquatic environment by blanketing so they will be forming mat mat like so i told in the earlier slide so blanketing or they will be form acting as a mat reduces light penetration and reduces gases exchange to in the water body and reduces water weight drainage also and displaces the other native plants so if you see the some of the images here in the bangalore lakes it is covered by these alternate thraphiloxerites that is uh, alligator weed so they will be growing profusely so this is the one so as a photo it is uh, uh, it can be and uh, uh, by humans also eating it is eaten so you can see here cow uh, eating the alternate thraphiloxerites that is alligator weed so this is one more image how we, along with the other macfights it is growing profusely in the lake so this is another image so uses as i said it is a leafy vegetable then medicine so high medicine use also there i have not put a particular uses but uh, it is it has high medicine values then fodder again uh, as you saw in the cow uh, image the cow is happily uh, eating that then phytoremediation so like other aquatic plants it is a phytoremediator and uh, compost as a compost also you can use next one more is uh, emergent uh, that is erect emergent uh, type plant that is uh, typha that belongs to family typhaceae so it is its common name is cat tail so because the flowering part it looks like a cat's tail it is called as uh, flower especially the flower it uh, 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 looks like a cat's tail that is why the common name is cat tail so it is common perennial marsh so again it's a perennial marshy plants so it is uh, growing in the uh, transition zones so marshy plant marshy areas then aquatic or uh, wetland plant in temperate so purely aquatic in sometimes sometimes uh, temperate zones or tropical zones and also in some sometimes subtropical climates they will be purely aquatic also so they may will be growing both type maybe purely aquatic or sometimes in the transition or, or in the marshy areas also so then plants if you see they are rhizomatous uh, monoecious herb rhizomatous means the um, stem will be like a rhizome so in ginger and all you can see the stem will be like a rhizome the type of stem is rhizome then uh, monoecious herb that is uh, plant is monoecious so dioecious and monoecious plants are there uh, it belongs to monoecious herb like grass and other plants then grow up to 1.5 to 3 meter height the height of the plant will be 1.5 to 3 meter high so erect emergent pl plant so if you see the image so erect so uh, they will be growing up to uh, that much height then leaves if you see radical uh, sheath radical and uh, the radical type of leaves and sheath will be white so if you see the sheath it will be white if you see carefully then flowering stem length is typically equal to or somewhat longer than the leaf length so the flowering stem will be separate along with the leaves you can see the flowering stem so especially uh, somewhat different uh, one stem will be having the flower one uh, if you see along with the leaves so that will be uh, equal or sometimes uh, longer than the leaf le uh, length so if you see image this is the flowering one flowering uh, stem so along with the leaves then numerous tiny dense flowers occur in the terminal spike so this flower type is spike so if you see the inflorescence it is a spike flower inflorescence it is belongs to uh, name called as spike inflorescence so small flowers in the group you can see so if you see this image this is the flower so if you see it is the small small flowers arranged at the uh, tip of the uh, stem so that is why it is called as spike inflorescence part the flower part is called as um, spike then 0.7 to 2 inches so if you measure the length then male, male flowers make up the upper part narrower half of the spike and the female flowers the lower if you see two partition you can see here in this the uh, upper part will be male flowers and uh, lower part will be the female flowers so that is the unpeculiarity of this fl uh, typha flower spike slightly wide, wider half so if you see the uh, um, uh, particular one uh, the female flowers in the lower and uh, they will be wider then flowering usually at uh, during the uh, june to august uh, time then pollinated by wind especially these flowers will be pollinated by wind so this uh, uh, this sexual reproduction usually uh, they will be following and the uh, pollination usually by uh, wind these flowers will be pollinated by wind so like uh, cotton they will be dispersing in the wind so this is these are the images especially in the jakkur lake you can see the typha in the shore lines uh, in the wetland the constructed wetland if you see the typha is growing profusely so this is one more Im image 
uh, where along with alternate and what has in the group of typha uh, growing in the middle of the lake and again if you see the significance they they act as phytomediators and wastewater in the wastewater treatments so in the constructed wetland uh, and the shorelines and all can grow this uh, typha and they will be acting as phytomediators then uh, Used as medicine fodder, so high amount of medicinal value is also there, and also fodder. Yeah. Cows uh, happily they will be eating, and uh, so many people they will cut the uh, along with the grasses these typha in the Bangalore lakes, and they will feed it to the cows. Then nutrient content, if you see percentage dry weight, it is uh, having nitrogen of two to four point five percent and phosphorus of point two to one point five percentage. Then these leaves are used for weaving mats and roofs, especially in the north. Uh, India and all sometimes you can see they will be uh, weaving mats and also for the houses the roofs so they will be using this uh, leaves of this typha then also in the compost they can use they will be using this leaves uh, sorry this plant especially entire plant then source of fuel also as a ethanol source especially bioethanol source also this cattail uh, along with the uh, water has in this is also one of the most widely studied plant for the biofuel especially then one more is creeping emergent plant that is Ludwigia uh, at the at certain, the, uh, that belongs to family on a graceae. So common name is water primrose. So it is called as water primrose and water dragon or marchi jasmine. These are some other names. So again, it is erect herb and the stems up to one meter tall. If you see the stem, it will be one meter tall. Then sometimes leaves with petioles up to two to 15 millimeter long. That is the length of petiole, leaf petiole. If you see the leaf petiole, then smooth leaves you can see. Then flowers are sessile without stalk, so they will be attached to the uh, like uh, in the alternator we saw with the clear stalk, but here it is without stalk that is sessile flowers. And tetramenus means uh, four petals, yellow flowers you can see. So petals four to five millimeter long and yellow, especially I am highlighting yellow flowers you can see. Found in wet places, sandy river beds along streams and rice fields. Also you can see this uh, float, uh, flo sorry the emergent ones that uh, flowering is especially during March to November. Then two types of roots you can see, especially in these plants. One will be anchoring this plant in the sediments or soil, while others will be containing air sacs. So they will be helping in the floating. So sometimes they will be floating in the, you can see in both conditions, sometimes in the uh, shore lines, also uh, floating also when it is in the water. So these uh, air sacs, the second type of uh, roots, uh, especially white colored ones, if you see cl clearly see, they will be containing white colored ones, air sacs. So that those are the second. It looks like root itself. So these are roots itself, but they will be helping in the uh, floating. So you can say they will be containing high amount of air and chyma. Then potential to become a serious pest. So again, if they grow seriously, they will be becoming pest or high profusely. Once uh, established, however, it becomes dense and uh, mon type stands along shorelines and banks, and then begins to sprawl out in, into water and can form floating islands of vegetation. So if you see the floating uh, floating things. They will be forming like an island one. It looks like an island. So in the water body. At this point, Ludwigia can clog waterways, dam structures, and, and dominate the native vegetation. Again, they will be replacing the other native vegetations. So this is the image showing the Ludwigia growing in the water body. So uh, another image showing the flower, yellow flowers. So these are the then again, if you see the significance, they will be having high amount of nitrogen and especially. So if you see the percentage wise, 2 to 5.52 percent uh, amount of um, percentage dry weight, they will be containing nitrogen and phosphorus little less 0.2 to 1.4 percentage. Then decreases level of ammonia and nitrates in the water and sediment. Again, they will be uh, taking the nitrogen source, especially ammonia source. So that is why they will be decreasing the ammonia level in the water and nitrates. So dissolved. Uh, N sources like ammonia and nitrate part they will be taking in the water uh, uh, and the sediment also sometimes from the sediment directly they will be taking nitrogen so especially they want high amount of uh, nitrogen content so two forms that is ammonia and nitrate they will be uh, taking from the water especially then leaf extract if you see they will be having a high amount of antiseptic uh, property and antimicrobial property if you see the phyto remedies sorry phytochemical extraction part uh, they will be having high amount of antiseptic property and antimicrobial compounds in these uh, leaves especially. So medicine for uh, dysentery and fever, the shoots especially used for dysentery and fever and uh, uh, food, the stems and leaves are also used as food and also sometimes they will grow it as an ornamental plant. One more uh, emergent plant 
that is erect one that is colocasia esculenta that is erasia erasia in the family the common name is elephant ear so because the uh, leaves will be looking like a elephant ear then uh, also one more name is taro so uh, habitat it is again perennial and will be growing in the marshy places especially but often in the standing still water streams and rivers and ponds so it will be having cluster of leaves with long erect petioles if you see the petiole the long erect petioles you can see so the uh, length is 40 to 100 cm cm tall from the large tuberous roots if you see the roots it will be tuberous type um, growing underground and the, the leaves will be emerging so with the two, 40 to 200 cm centimeter length uh, petioles so ry rhizomes tuberous and starch filled so high amount of starch they will be containing this so they will be used as a food source then the stems stick up to one meter height uh, they will be having stem of one meter height and petioles up to one meter long the leaf petiole will be one meter long and inflorescence again shorter than the petioles so this is the inflorescence part so this will be uh, smaller than the petioles has the ability to reproduce both sexually and vegetative reproduction so sexually by seeds and vegetatively by the combs or the starch part that is um, especially the tuberous ripe zones tubers and stalk um, root stalk suckers so the, uh, these are the tubers you can see so through them they will be having vegetative reproduction so this is the image of them so commonly used for making some of the food sources in the uh, rural areas in india especially then signification uh, significance if you see a very important staple food crop in many parts of tropics as i said it will be in the villages and all they will be using it as a food source widely cultivated for its starchy rhizomes yeah the rhizome is eaten because of high starch amount and edible leaves also so medicine uh, medicinal property if you see antibacterial and also the bp it will be reducing bp then nutrient content when you see nitrogen content of 0.6 to 1.9 percent is dry weight and phosphorus content of 0.1 to 1.3 percent it will be containing and highly used as fodder again uh, it will be eaten up by cattle and other uh, uh, animals and as a fodder one more is one more emergent uh, uh, erect emergent that is polygonum glabrum that is belonging to family polygonaceae so common name is common marsh buck, uh, buckwheat so it is somewhat uh, similar to wheat plants that's why it is common marsh buckwheat it is growing in the marshy areas so if you see it will be 2.5 centimeter uh, tall stems it will be having and short petiole so leaf with short petiole you can see it will be attached to the stem uh, flowers in terminal and axillary. So, if you see the flowers, it will be pinkish and in the terminal spike. So, at the tip, it will be having 7 to 10 centimeter long spike. Uh, then, habitat perennial or annual, it will be and along the water courses. And uh, especially uh, uh, along with the typha in the shorelines, you can see also in the marshy areas. And reproductive phase is during October to March. So, this is the image of that. So, in the shorelines, it will be especially growing. And uh, uh, at the tip, uh, it will be having pinkish flowers spike. Significance again, it will be used in uh, medicines like fever, treating fever, uh, jaundice, burns, and wounds. Then tender branches and leaves used as a vegetable. Again, it is as a uh, used as a food source. Then also as a insect repellent. So it will be having if you cut that a plant, it will be having smell. So it is a insect repellent, especially for mosquitoes and all. One more uh, creeping emergent one is uh, Ipomia aquatica. Water spinach, commonly called as so, it is it is like a spinach leaves. So uh, our common spinach. So it is called as water spinach. So it is uh, growing in the water water bodies. So family Convolvulaceae. So common name is swamp swamp morning glory or water spinach. So it is aquatic annual or perennial again. Then stem will be hollow. If you cut the stem, it will be hollow stem, floating and swollen. So two to three long uh, long the stem uh, over the ground. So it will be around the uh, over the ground and Corolla. If you see the corolla, it will be pinkish. The flower, it will be having pinkish corolla. Then darker in the throat. I will show the image. Then funnel shape. So, if you see the flowers, so corolla will be pink. The petals and the funnel shape of flowers clearly you can see. Then habitat again, it is perennial, usually floating on the stagnant waters. So sometimes found on the banks of pools, canals, and the rivers. Then growing period or the flowering period will be especially during the September to February, the reproductive phase, the flowering phase will be September to February. Then the significance, if you see, it is cultivated for its edible shoots and leaves. The plant shoots, especially stems and leaves are eaten as a food source. Then also it has high amount of medicinal contents also. Then for nutrient treatment or the phytoremediation uses and also it will be serious weed if it grows profusely. You can see here in the banks it is uh, profusely growing.
so as a weed one more uh, uh, again the emergent one that is sagittaria so alice might say so common name is arrowhead because the leaves are like that arrow looks like arrow that is why it is called as arrowhead annual or perennial it will be then found in shallow water bodies edges of the canals and ditches in slowly growing uh, flowing water it will be seen this are the habitat and leaves will be floating or submerged again if you see the leaves arrow shaped as i said it will be arrow shaped then they will be produced at the terminal end of the petiole up to 45 cm length the leaves uh, long, length will be 45 cm and blades will be linear then flowers in whorls three groups in the three so it will be pro uh, produced and petals white uh, pink and purple and brown spot near the base and so the image then edible it is edible and medicine the uses are it is edible and in medicine so this is the flower so as i said so white flowers uh, with three whorls and uh, you can see a three 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 in the three groups whorls it is called as whorl that is as a three so this is uh, the leaf if you see this is arrow type that is why arrow so this is the image of this plant then one more is a uh, common grass uh, grass belongs to grass family cypressi that is cypress species so so many species are there so these are uh, also em emergent ones uh, especially erect ones in the shorelines you can see in the marshy areas so common uh, there are many species are there so common name is for uh, them is nut grass then uh, they will be annual or perennial sometimes then uh, leaves mostly radical as in the uh, typha it will be radical leaves and usually shorter than the culm and leaf like or reduced to scale like sheets so if you see the leaves it will be shorter and reduced uh, sheets so small uh, scale like sheets it is called as then common weed in cultivated fields and wetlands so it is a uh, common weed and in the river banks and uh, pools and ditches like uh, cattail typha difficult to eradicate when it grows so it will be growing through the stem that is tubers it is again like colocasia it will be spreading from that vegetative reproduction that is why it will grow profusely if you see the nutrient content again it is having 0.75 to 1.75 percent of uh, nitrogen per dry weight and uh, 0.02 to 1 percentage of phosphorus uh, percentage in the dry weight uh, nutrient removal capacity if you see nitrogen of 7.4 kg per hectare per day and phosphorus 1.3 kg per hectare per day is the removal capacity again it is widely used in medicine then they will be acts as uh, acting as soil stabilizers so in the uh, shoreline areas and all to stabilize the soil they will be growing these grasses then some species are cultivated for food so so many stems uh, the tubers especially they will be eaten and some are used for fibers or perfume also some uh, plants some as uh, cypress species especially some are grown as ornamental plants some species are uh, ornamental also so next plant is marsilia so marsilia is here and it is commonly called as water clover so uh, the leaf is clover type that is why it is called as water clover uh, it is growing in the water then uh, that is why water clover then um, perennial or annual again it is found in shallow pools so again in the shallow regions you can see edges of rivers canals lakes and rice fields you can see most abundant in temporarily flood flooded places where it forms dense colonies so not permanent uh, uh, covered by areas uh, water areas so uh, sometimes in the temporarily flooded areas you can see these plants profusely growing in the rice fields also plants mat forming so they will be again like uh, alternator they will be forming mats rhizome slender very uh, 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 slight thin slender uh, rhizomes you can see that is part and uh, wiry repeatedly branched creeping or floating so they will be creeping then leaves spirally rolled so uh, when young if you see the leaves when they are young it will be spirally rolled if i have image i will show you then compound then uh, leaflets uh, compound leaf that is uh, more than th three four petals you can see leaflets very uh, variable that is 2 to 25 mm long that is leaflets bilobed to many lobed if you see the lobe they will be having two lobes or sometimes uh, many lobes that is four lobes floating leaflets with margins entire so margins uh, if you see it will be uh, entire the, if you see the leaflets then sporangia that is uh, they will be having uh, spores so reproduction through especially through these uh, spores so they will be having spores in the structure called as sporangia so they will be in uh, a close sporocarps so they will be containing in the spore contained in the sporocarps so more now short talks are in some details are in the axis there so along with the uh, petiole they will be uh, containing this spore containing structure that is sporocarps sporangia so if you can clear, uh, see them 
these four carbs they will be reproducing from these parts uh, structures four carbs so reproductive phase uh, if you see that is now number to january then significance high, highly used in the medicine so it is used as a medicine anti inflammatory then uh, food also angstroms and leaves so this is uh, like uh, uh, brahmi uh, this is also one of the highly used medicine plant, plant medicine plant so this is the structure if you see the thing these are the sporocarps along the petiole you can see small thing so these are the sporocarps and the sporangia containing structures so these are called as sporocarps through which they will be reproducing so this is the leaves when it is young it is uh, spirally coiled and mature ones they will have four leaflets so this is the drawing of that plant so this is the image of uh, plant which is growing in the pond uh, lakes then last uh, next one category is floating leaved ones so i'll quickly run through some of the examples uh, so one is potamogeton that is uh, group, uh, belonging to family potamogeton gatanaceae so common name is pond weed so stems usually elongate they will be having uh, long uh, stems then flexible so these are flexible stems submerged or floating or stoloniferous and creeping so again it will be creeping like uh, ludwigia and alternta creeping ones but uh, the plant is uh, floating leaved ones so leaves will be always floating leaves submerged or floating sometimes it will be submerged sometimes some leaves will be submerged also so habitat again it will be perennial throughout the, the growing season or the throughout the year you can see these plants or sometimes annually also then found in a wide variety of aquatic plants habitats that is uh, 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 wide variety of habitats you can see uh, highly nutrient conditions or sometimes pure conditions also then totally submerged or within uh, floating leaves uh, yeah as i said uh, sometimes submerged and leaves also can be seen so this is the image of that plant so you can see here uh, floating leaves and these are the flower parts and uh, significance if you see this is uh, used as a medicine and also as a food one more is uh, common plant that is lotus nelumbo nucifera nelumbo nesia family is nelumbo nesia common name is lotus then morphology if you see it is large perennial plant with milky latex so if you cut the plant it will be having milky latex stems are dimorphic uh, that is uh, you will see uh, two types of stems then uh, slender horizontal vegetative stolons or rhizomes or thickened storage rhizomes so this is these are again rhizomes they will be having thickened storage rhizomes so they will be uh, acting as a storage part uh, then food storage especially so they will be eaten so leaves alternate then uh, petals up to 3 meter or long again if you see the leaves it will be alternate type so uh, not a uh, uh, opposite or thing it is alternate type petals uh, if you see it will be 3 meter then flowers will be large 8 to 27 cm diameter and pink to red or white type so if you see the flowers it will be pink uh, common lotus so um, the color varies from pink red or it will be white then significance highly cultivated as a uh, crop for its edible rhizomes as i said the rhizomes will be eaten then it will be edible nuts they will be containing nuts then grown for ornament then as a ornamental plant uh, we all know it is a ornamental plant leaves are used for serving food so the long leaves uh, large leaves it will be hang so sometimes it will be used for serving food and the medicine high medicinal uh, property also it has then flowers uh, uh, religious uh, rituals and temples so it has high religious value so for puja and all uh, for us will be using this uh, lotus flower especially and uh, it has religious uh, importance also so if you see the goddess and all uh, then uh, uh, this is the image of that uh, lotus or nelumbos Uh, nucifera uh, large leaves you can see and uh, flowers pink with uh, petals white okay. so next one is nymphaea lily common lily it is called as nymphaeaceae the family is nymphaeaceae so it is again herbaceous plant with perennial tuberous root stalks so if you see the root stalk it is again tuberous the root it will be tuberous so again it will be eaten and uh, leaves with a deep sinus if you see the leaf uh, leaves it will be having deep sinus or uh, partition part you can see in the image so veins mostly radiating from the meeting point of the petiole so he, from the meeting part of this uh, you can see the veins and uh, 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 repeatedly fork so the fork so if you see the edges it will be uh, fork type flowers born above the water surface so flowers are above the surface blue white uh, rose Uh, or purple that is the color of purple, uh, flowers so we can see here pink flowers uh, so this is the image of that plant 
then significance again it is food source the tubers then uh, rhizomes used as uh, tubers food sources seeds also then ornamental again like uh, 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 lotus then medicine value it has then flowers again it is also for religious uh, rituals temples and all it is offered as offered to gods then nymphoids indica one more so that is also called as uh, water snowflake so again it is a perennial plant or uh, floating or creeping plant so if you see the run uh, the stem will be runner like so resembling the petioles then leaves will be alternate if you see the leaves it will be alternate type and flowers especially uh, if you see solitary single flowers or in the clusters arising from the erect stem and supported by floating leaves if you see the flowers will be along with the leaves supported by the leaves that is a one peculiarity and sepals with the triangular and petals white so if you see the flowers triangular ones and white petals yellow center the center one it is center part it is yellow yeah then deep leaf fringed on the surface with long white hairs so we can see clearly here the hairs and the deep fringed fringed and deep so the uh, significance again it is used in medicine then food uh, as a food leaves and stems are used as a food and flower temple offerings again so that is about uh, floating leaf ones and finally we will come to submerged plants so if you see submerged some of the examples like ceratophyllum commonly called as spoon tail then uh, if you see the morphology the leaves are a bright green uh, or olive green uh, so green leaves you can see then uh, habitat if you see perennial or annual and totally submerged ones Uh, then it will be uh, reproductive uh, part uh, time will be september to november and if you see the significance it is also high uh, phytoremediator again uh, in the uh, if you see the submerged ones uh, along with the other um, uh, this ceratophyllum uh, act as high phytoremediator then medicine also so uh, to reduce the fever and all uh, treating fever and all then also as a fodder so this is the image of ceratophyllum so deeply uh, Uh, dissected leaves you can see here then hydrilla second one is commonly used uh, uh, experimental plant that is uh, hydrilla vertical uh, in the labs so to see the oxygen uh, respiration so in the uh, leaves we will use this plant so submerged plant and uh, so mostly perennial but sometimes annual also so growing in stilly or slowly flowing water if you see it will be growing in still or slowly flowing water also then the reproductive period is during october to october to march so if you see the stems it will be elongate branched so it is elongate stems it will be having and branched regularly and uh, it will be having uh, um, this leaves strapped shape so if you see the leaves it is strap shape and pointed tips will be having pointed tips if you see it will be having pointed tips and uh, uh, the color so vary from green yellow to brown sometimes browny um, brownish colored leaves also can be seen and it is used as a fish feed so in the aquarium and all it will be used as a fish feed sometimes then phytoremediators again uh, like ceratophyllum it is a, uh, uh, it will be absorb by high, high amount of uh, nutrients from especially from the water then one more is wallis neria so again it is also uh, submerged totally submerged plant in the uh, aquarium and all will grow this plant and uh, uh, roots and branch and uh, keystone species so as a uh, submerged plant a very important species in the uh, when you consider the submerged plants this uh, this plant is keystone species providing valuable in stream habitat for food for fish macronutrients and fresh water minerals so for all these organisms it provides food that is why keystone species so in aquarium also we will grow this so it is also uh, useful indicator species for a range of ecosystem and bio indicators it is used as very um, especially as a bio indicators then uh, if you see another one it is uh, najas so totally submerged ones again so bottom root but uh, parts often becoming detached so this is the image of najas so uh, especially if you see the image it will be submerged and uh, the rooted parts it will be detaching and uh, sometimes freely floating in the water surface so significance used as a food so highly uh, highly nutritious in fact then one more is otelia erismoids again the uh, uh, submerged plant duck relatives it is called as so if you see the roots it is unbranched and the flowers especially if you see the flowers it is single flower Uh, if you see the white flowers so petals with white or tinged with the lilac pink sometimes uh, the color will pink then held on a long peduncle if you see it will be with long peduncle the stalk then uh, which project is about the surface of water it will be usually about the surface of water then again uses are like uh, as a food and medicine also it is used so this is the image of this plant 
so submerged plant then one more is kara so this is the uh, belongs to algae group so uh, so again one more submerged plant musk grass or stone what it is called as so the specificity of this is uh, especially the the uh, calcium uh, granules so in the leaves so you can see the calcium granules so that is one of the peculiarity then uh, these algae are identified by their long strong strong like garlic smell especially evident when crushed when you crush that uh, you uh, smell the garlic like smell you will be observing so this is the image of that so uh, if you see uh, in clear waters this will be growing submerged ones then uh, if you see the all these macrophytes these are about the types of uh, macrophytes some examples then if you compare some of the uh, lakes uh, if you see the polluted versus uh, non polluted uh, lakes so an example i am giving in bangalore condition himigepura lake which is a non polluted lake you can see all those uh, whatever we have discussed that is submerged emergent floating floating leaves all species you can see whereas in the polluted lakes like balandur you can see only floating and some of the emerged whereas the submerged you won't find and floating leaves also you can you won't see so that is the difference between the polluted and uh, non polluted lakes especially as a bio indicator how you can uh, Uh, use these uh, macrophytes as a bio indicators so polluted uh, and versus non polluted lakes if you see the diversity you will see only in the uh, the floating and emergence especially in the polluted lakes so that is the one uh, uh, peculiarity of these macrophytes i highlighted then again if you see the uses as in the constructed wetlands so to treat the uh, waste water in the uh, constructed wetland we can use these uh, macrophytes especially so for example in jakul lake Uh, our research group uh, energy and wetlands research group studied the jakur lake uh, so here uh, constructed wetland is there so how the especially the you know, emergent macrophytes along with the uh, some of the uh, floating ones so especially water hyacinth and uh, pistia how they will be treating the waste water from the uh, especially from the uh, stp so and also sometimes un untreated water comes so it is allowed to the jakul lake so how it uh, it, is, it contributes to the treatment of waste water especially in the constructed wetlands so we will be growing these macrophytes in the uh, artificially in the wetlands that is how we can use it as uh, uh, sewage treatment in the sewage treatment this is the observation what we saw so if you see the inflow the, the water characteristics are very high amount of cod vod and nitrate and phosphate it reduced to when you see 88 to Uh, 58 percent. So overall reduction is 72 percentage, and BOD reduced to 89 percent. Then nitrate up to 35 percent, and phosphate up to 71 percentage. So this much reduction we saw in the from the inlet to the outlet of the lake through this, uh, especially from the uh, uh, wetland. So constructed wetland when it flows to the lake and at the outlet of the lake, you can see the total reduction of this much percentage. So that is how it can be used in the constructed wetlands. Then again in the heavy metal accumulation, how it can be used. so especially our study in the vartur and balandur wetlands so if you see it was uh, accumulating high amount of chromium copper nickel and lead uh, which was the normal range it will be uh, in uh, this is the normal range so but it was uh, accumulating uh, some 10 times so uh, 10 to uh, 20 times higher than the normal range in these plants especially especially in the water hyacinth and typha and other emergent uh, plants especially and uh, the floating ones that is especially water hyacinth and wisteria so these are the metals what we have seen so chromium copper nickel and lead was accumulating highest in those plants these are just images how we sampled and again the lab conditions we observed how it will be uh, helpful in the removal of these uh, especially nutrients like nitrates and phosphates so if you see the water hyacinth and pistia especially i studied uh, we studied the water hyacinth pistia and lemna so the uptake capacity was highest for water hyacinth then comes the lemna and pistia that is nitrate so the percentage wise if you see 25 percentage for water hyacinth and then pistia 17 percentage and lemna 20 percentage of nitrates is removed from the water so we artificially growed in the lab conditions and saw the removal capacity and ammonia if you see it is again the water hyacinth had highest amount of removal capacity uh, 60% 50% for pistia they are removing and lemna 45% then phosphate it was uh, again water hyacinth so if you see three this uh, flo three floating macrophytes water hyacinth had the highest uh, amount of um, removal capacity of these uh, nutrients especially phosphate and uh, 
nitrates that is ammonia and nitrate that is nitrogen forms in the water so these are uh, about uh, uh, natural in uh, about macrophytes how uh, the types and what is their significance and our uh, study about these uh, especially the phytoremediation capacity or the nutrient capacity removal capacity of these uh, macrophytes in bangalore area that is bangalore lakes how we studied so this is uh, about uh, 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 my talk uh, thank you for patient listening Thank you, Dr. Sudarshan, for sharing uh, your uh, vast research on uh, macrophytes. So I now uh, request you to uh, answer some of the questions. So there are uh, questions on, are macrophyte species are invasive in nature? Yes, some of them are invasive. OK. Uh, I'm just checking whether there are any other questions. Sir, can you name some of the macrophytes which can be used to control the pollution in Bangalore lakes? So uh, the study I have highlighted already, is, uh, the water hyacinth, so which has the highest amount of uptake capacity. And uh, after the nutrient removal, it can be used for some other purposes also. So for the... Uh, Removal of uh, pollution, especially water hyacinth, then typha. So the emergent ones, if you consider typha and alternantra, suits best for the Bangalore conditions, and water hyacinth also suits uh, very best because they will be uh, profusely growing in the Bangalore conditions. If you see the Bangalore lakes, they will be highly profusely growing. So that those three are the major species, and you can see some other species like uh, Ludwigia and uh, yes, Ludwigia uh, and. Uh, uh, yeah, these are the main species you can use. Uh, if you are using in Bangalore, it depends on the area. If you have to see the uh, conditions, what are the conditions and the climate conditions and which are the dominating macrophytes there. So to that condition and uh, the water quality also. So and then you can grow the, use these plants. You can select the plants. So while selecting, you can have to consider all those factors like uh, growth conditions, like climatic factors, the area then uh, the nutrient conditions how much uh, amount of nutrient is there then the uh, uh, which uh, from the water especially if you want to see uh, you have to see the water content the nutrient content in the water and all so that is how you can select the species so bangalore especially i told already have discussed those species so those are the best ones okay Th thank you dr sudarshan uh, looks like there are no further queries so on behalf of NV's uh, Center at Institute of Science, uh, I thank Dr. Sudarshan for sharing his time with us. And uh, I also thank the participants who have uh, uh, asked the questions and uh, uh, try to uh, get knowledge from Dr. Sudarshan. So I think uh, uh, the participants can re register, uh, subscribe to our uh, NV's channel so that they will be notified whatever the uh, interesting talks we conduct uh, under the Ek Bharat Sest Bharat initiative. So with this, uh, we are ending the session. Uh, once again, thank you, Dr. Sudarshan. I, uh, I also thank other participants who, who have uh, been actively uh, uh, participated in this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bharat. Thank you, Ananda. So I took a little uh, extra time.